You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts. Uncle Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth Management, along with Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian and Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody, that rocking bit of tunage means it is time to rock out once again. With the Option Block, your bi-weekly source for all things options-related, a little bit of options wit, some wisdom, some analysis, some unusual activity. These days, a whole bunch of your questions. <laughs> Mix it together with a little bit of a peer. Into the future, you got the Option Block. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as the ever-busy network these days. Hope you guys are enjoying the slew of content we got coming at you. More to come, so stay tuned. Keeping you busy. Getting all your questions. You guys have lots of fun questions. Some of them are on the same theme over and over again, so we get it. You guys really want us to talk about that one issue, so I think we're going to do that in more detail. Perhaps even today. I think we got some more of your questions on that exact same topic. So we'll get to all of that, of course. Keep those questions coming. You guys can join us live if you want them answered immediately. That's on Mondays and Thursdays, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern, via the Mixler. That Mixler is live kind of throughout the week with various shows. So you, you know this show is live, but also you got Bob Views on Friday. 1 p.m. You got Twifo after this one, so stay tuned for that. And a little bit later, if you got questions on the old futures options side, and there's more scattered throughout the week. Once in a while, I get to wrestle Brian live on OPR. We did that last week. That was fun. So uh, a lot of live fun stuff. If you haven't followed us on Mixler yet, make sure you do that. We'll, it'll notify you the second we go live for all of our shows, not just this one, but throughout the week. So it's a great way. If you like stuff immediately, I know a lot of you do these days. And that's the easiest way to get it. You don't have to wait for the podcast. You don't have to subscribe or download. Even though we like all that and keep doing that. Of course, if you like what you listen to, make sure you head on out there. Leave a review so more folks can continue to discover the network in these troubled times. It's good, it's good for what ails them out there. All right, and joining me on the old program today, we got my cohorts, my partners in crime. Let's start off out there in the hinterlands where, like I said, he was rocking N95 masks and self-isolating way before it was cool. <laughs> It's the Rock Loster, Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi from OptionPit.com by way of Carmen Lion Capital, coming to us, I believe, from a mask right now in the compound of Maine. Mr. Rock Lobster, welcome back to the program. You might want to take the mask off for the rest of the show, sir. It'll be hard to hear you. Yeah, I thought I, I don't think I need to wear the mask while I'm in my office self-isolating like I do every day of the year for the last several years. I don't even know how long it's been anymore. I'm like... I'm like Methuselah waiting to wake up again from a long sleep, I think. Yep, you just wake up in the morning, just a regular random Tuesday, put that mask on. You know, so this is no different for you, isolating from humanity. That This is pretty much a, a day. We're all living a day in the life of the Rock Lobster right now, listeners. Enjoy. <laughs> As we keep on rolling on out to another area where he doesn't need no stinking mask because they got the weather shield out there, which has also got some HEPA filters built in. So it's good for viruses. <laughs> He is Uncle Mike Tussaud from St. Charles Wealth Management. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the program. Glad to have you back on the modern technology known as Skype, sir. 
Well, let's see if the internet holds up. But it's always good to be back on Skype, to say the least. All right. It's always good to be back with you folks as we get right into it. A little bit of the old trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Trading Block. And it's, a, it's an interesting one. The market's certainly feeling their oats today, which is surprising because we saw uh, a jobless claims numbers that I think could be euphemistically described as apocalyptic it was pretty bad last week. Remember, it was 3.3 million. The economists out there, uh, the dismal bunch that they are, had expected, anticipated about 1.5 million. They got 3.3 million. Well, pretty much double that this week because they came in at a staggering 6.6 million. Pretty much uh, the highest on record. It's about in line with the craziness we saw at the end of the, uh, the Great Recession of 2007 to 2009. Back then, a record 6.6 million people. Uh, drew benefits. That was at the very end of the recession. We had that many apply last week. So over the last two weeks, that's close to 10 million people who have applied for jobless benefits now, unemployment benefits, which is a staggering number. If you back that number out, most economists say that translates to at least about 10% unemployment out there looking at beyond just those numbers, uh, So, if not higher. So it's it's pretty staggering, but they're looking right now at maybe expecting, again, we Take economist expectations with a bit of a grain of salt here, but they're expecting 25 million Americans going to be unemployed in the next few weeks to months, which is a number that is uh, just kind of hard to fathom at this point. But again, these are the most dire prognostications. We hope it doesn't come to pass, as it does indeed for the disease and the health impacts out there as well. Let's look on to what's going on from an overall market impact. And like I said, the markets are kind of celebrating this news, even though analysts out there like Bank of America saying they're preparing for the deepest recession on record, again, on the heels of these horrible jobless claims numbers. Yet the market's up pretty firmly today. S&P up nearly 1.5%. That's actually leading the charge today. NASDAQ and Dow both up about 1%. Dow actually a little bit more, about 1.15%. So Dow playing the Goldilocks role today. Everything kind of up today. Gold and crude. Uh, Trump talking up, maybe trying to do a little bit of a detente out there. In, uh, in crude land, and as a result, seeing a little bit of a lift out there as well. USO back over the five handle after threatening the four handle to the downside. The much maligned USO, and fairly so these days. Not exactly uh, the best way to play crude, but I know for a lot of you, you like to get into those ETPs. It's just easier than the futures and other products like that. So I get it, I get it. But still, a lot of crazy stuff afoot out there. The VIX, also a little crazy, coming into showtime. It was at, oh, about 52 and a half. That puts it down about seven and a half handles. And it's still pretty much about 52 and a half right now. VVIX, a.k.a. the volatility of volatility, at about a 151. It's down about nine handles from where it was last week. So we're coming off the at least the near-term apex of the crazy volatility we saw there. Obviously, we're moving, but we're not quite moving 4% anymore. We're only up a, a paltry, a meager Almost one and a half percent in the S and P right now. So that's a far cry from four plus percent we were moving a day over the last few weeks. So if that number comes in, the net movement comes in. Of course, ball has to come in a little bit as well. And our old friend VXX also coming down a little bit, shy of the fifty handle again. Forty seven point eight puts it down almost exactly two point two points. It was about fifty exactly on our last show out there. So a lot to unpack before I get further into the numbers. Let's first go around the horn. Let's start with the Rock Lobster before he puts his mask back on. Mr. Rock Lobster, sir, a lot unfolding. What is lighting up your tape out there, and what is what is going on in the Vol Trading Club in these crazy times, sir? Uh, the Vol Trading Club, we really only have one open trade. Uh, it is not going super well, I have to say. At the meantime, we got a couple weeks to run, um, but mostly uh, Vol's not moving anymore. <laughs> we, I'll tell you what: if you would ask me a year ago, fifty VIX, lots of excitement. We're hanging out of fifty three, fifty four. Come play. Exciting every day. No, it's not. Um, uh, the severe backwardation. So the futures move a little bit, but the relative moves are just not that big anymore. Um, a one-week straddle in VXX is 10 bucks, and the underlying has moved all of $3 today. So 
I'm just saying the vault products right now to me are kind of a morass. I'm not adding anything else, and that's a good part of the strategy. We layer it in. So right now I just have one trade on, and that's it. I will not so be you're adding saying, to it you're at saying, all. You're saying the glorious period where everyone could just buy straddles and make money, that, that period has finally come to an end, sir? In the vault products, yes. In SPY, SPX, no. There's still, I think, like two, three-day opportunity in those. Um, yesterday we were down at 12 bucks. Today we had like a two-and-a-half handle rally. So there's still, uh, you know, if you structure things a little better, um, there's still opportunity there. This is only one day. Um, and at last, I think, even last week, remember we had that awful number. Everybody's like, oh, my God. And then we rallied huge. And everybody realized, holy sugar, we had a really bad employment number. And they, everything sold off from there. So, you know, I think we go from, uh, you know, reality to unreality in this situation, meaning, it's it's bad. All these people have been laid off. We're stopping businesses everywhere. We don't know how long this is going to go. And, you know, the market has fits and starts of rallies and then kind of just poops out until we have, uh, you know, I think more clarity on just how long this Corona thing is going to last and what's going to happen. So from a vol point of view, though, we're at 50 and we have not been able to break below 50. Um because we still keep getting like a 5% move, you know, every three or four days. So that's enough to kind of keep uh, VIX at around 50. Uh, so you've got, you just don't have a lot of action in the wall products, strangely enough, but that's what it is. Um, there's just not a lot of action, a lot of action in the wall products. Now, it, vol could get lower if everybody kind of gets bored and the market just kind of, uh, just kind of slowly grinds away. Um, but you know, the Fed's done their thing on the upside. They're trying to stabilize markets. So it's, you know, until you start getting really good positive news, uh, I'm kind of looking around for it. Like, where is it going to come from? Um, and the only thing that's going to happen is, you know, this whole virus situation, they get some kind of handle on it, which I still feel like it's kind of up in the air at this point. Um, so anyway, as far as uh, stocks, individual stocks, you guys can talk about those, but Vol, I just think is it's not a very interesting trade right now, and I normally I say I love it, um, but it's kind of an avoidable thing I think, at, at least where it is right now, just a difficult spot. Yeah, it's in that kind of difficult rear range, right, where it's kind of hard to buy, it kind of hard to sell. We're talking about uh, talking about that with our old friend BXX on the Volviews. I think it was last week. Oh, we're talking about some puts, and they're, they're, they were garbage whether you sold them. They were garbage whether you bought them. It was kind of that weird range where, you know, it's the dangerous range. It's kind of hard to kind of hard to play in those waters unless you know what you're doing, in which case maybe you stay back a little bit or you definitely keep your size small, stay nimble. No, none of these set it and forget it trades. you got to kind of babysit it. Luckily, you got some time on your hands probably, so <laughs> pay attention to what you're putting on out there. And if you're, if you're just flummoxed by these crazy markets, it's okay. It's okay to keep your powder dry a little bit out there, too. No, guy's not keeping his powder dry because he's in it to win it. He's trading up a storm nonstop, especially in that silver collar. He can't stop adjusting. Of course, I'm talking about none other than Uncle Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth Management. Uncle Mike, regale us, sir, with the litany of things that you are doing when you're out there doing stuff right now, including the silver collar, sir. Oh, I'm doing all sorts of stuff. Okay, so in terms of what I'm doing at this stage, um, I'm really not doing that much. I mean, my rule for my aggressive trading, which typically uh, takes up a lot of my time, uh, is that when markets go negative on the year, I get out. And so for that, I'm really not doing that much. I'm probably 99% cash with that right now. And so uh, I'm just kind of chilling. I'll get back into my aggressive trading when either the markets turn positive on the year or January 2nd, 2021, whichever comes first. So we'll see with that. Um so a lot going, not a lot going on with that. Uh, in my risk reversals right now, I mean, I got away from buying calls with the risk reversals uh, probably about a month ago, and I've just been kind of rolling puts down on the way down. But uh, with that, I'm still above my lines in the sand, at least for now. And so just trying to do that. I, I think that the opportunities in the marketplace right now are... I believe if you can handle owning a stock or owning the index, if you want to do this on like an SPY or a DIA or something along those lines, I believe the opportunities are selling premium if you don't mind owning the underlying. I think that if you want to lever yourself and uh, be leveraged in this environment, not a huge <laughs> excuse me, fan of that. 
Hence the reason with my levered trading, I'm not doing it. Uh, but there really are a lot of opportunities to sell premium if you believe that you're fine owning the underlying and riding this out for a while and managing risk that, that way. So that's kind of what I like right now. Uh, of course, the big news today uh, is with oil. Uh, the big news is always, it seems to be, with uh, what's going on in the coronavirus world. Um, there's a, a meeting between, or it looks like there might be some type of uh, uh, production increase, or I'm sorry, some type of um, way with which to get the price of oil to come up. And the Saudis and the Russians, may or may, they might be talking, they might not be talking, who knows with that. But uh, that, of course, is some pretty big news. Uh, but overall, I think that where we are right now, we still have not gotten back near the gains or near the losses of what we we took yesterday so we still have a ways to go with that but um vix is in the low 50s right now so i guess that's kind of good and a good sign i would think for the bulls out there but um i just want to emphasize that there i i do all, i am the perma bull of the show but you do need to be short-term cautious and times like this are the reason as to why so that is my take as to what's going on these days Oh, you forgot your 20-minute upgrade on the silver collar. Go, sir. I have a lot of time for you. Uh, my 20-minute silver collar up, update. Uh, I, I, I really wish that I had one. I mean, the biggest update on that is that uh, volatility went so high that uh, I really couldn't close any calls on it. The calls are almost the same value they were when I got into it. It's it's crazy. So, um, either way, uh, I'm still hedged. I'm still looking at it, but... Uh, Sad to say, I'm not doing anything. I, I, I just have to apologize yet again for the biggest letdown for uh, sh show material in option block history. I thought this was going to be the second coming of my Apple collar, but uh, unfortunately, it has been a ginormous letdown for content for the show. Yeah, content-wise, a bit of a bust. Sounds like a little bit better from a trading perspective, but we don't care about that here on the show. We want the quality content. <laughs> so far, at least, been a bit of a disappointment. Let's see if the market's are disappointing us out there today. Like we mentioned, a little bit less movement than we have seen of late. So that's probably going to translate into less volume. Again, we're also in these kind of weird, somewhat wide, kind of thin markets out there. You know, just think about it, listeners. Every trading floor is shut down, obviously. But also the virtual trading floors, these trading desks that were places you know, like Goldman, all the big banks are all shut down as well. So these guys are running these desks effectively from their home bandwidth, the home broadband connection in their basement. And stuff. Just think about that for a second. You know that that's what's the core of our liquidity right now, and our customer order flow is coming out of some guy on his home broadband. <laughs> Maybe he's got a trading turret. They upgraded him a little bit uh, to call around a little bit. That's pretty much it. They're all in a similar boat to what you are, except for a handful of firms that have these bunkers uh, in certain areas. But outside of that, it's really you know a guy, his kids are running around at home while he's trying to maintain his book on his trading desk out there. So that's what we got out there. For liquidity, and yet things seem to be holding up, surprisingly. Uh, we got volume-wise a little bit light today, but again, that's not surprising. We're not really lighting up the tape. VIX at just about 130,000 contracts as of a few minutes ago. The ADV still north of a million, 1.14 million, but coming down a little bit. SPY at about two and three quarters million contracts exactly. The ADV six and a half million, still north of six. That's just a that's a ton of paper, but anyway, you, anyway, you cut it. The S at about 678,000 contracts as of a few minutes ago. The ADB out there, a little bit shy of two, 1.92. If you know anything about the S, you know, that's a little light compared to what it has been. But still, that's a freaking SPX. That's about as pit-traded of a product almost as it gets. And it's still managing to hold up a fairly decent clip, all things considered, out there. The Q's. At just a tick under half a million contracts, 499,000 contracts, the ADV 875 out there, and the IWM at 367,000 contracts, the ADV 645,000. Let's go out there to see what the most active individual names are out there. It's an interesting one today, the top 10. Kind of some weird names, which is kind of fun, mixing it up a little bit. Uh, number 10 out here, we got the old Zooms. It's been Microsoft for a long time, dominating out there with the Skype. Now we got Zoom. Creaking in there, Zoom at 149,000 contracts. There, of course, Zoom, the video teleconferencing that everyone seems to be talking about and using these days. Number nine, we've got good old Exxon Mobil. They haven't been in the top 10 in quite some time. They are today, 163,000 contracts, of course, on the heels of that Trump movement to try to bolster crude prices in some way, shape, or form. Not surprising, we have seen the first wave of bankruptcies coming out of the U.S. shale oil producers. 
folks in that neck of the woods. And indeed, a lot of the U.S. economy don't want to see a lot of those producers go out of business. So trying to take some steps to shore that up. Number eight, good old softy. In there at 186,000 contracts. So it's a pretty robust top 10. Cost you nearly a buck 50 to break into the top 10 today. So even though the equity, I should say the indices, are not really lighting it up, individual names doing some paper today. Number seven, AMD, still out there in the top 10, day in, day out. 188,000 contracts. Number five, good old Bank of America, 192,000 contracts. And if that wasn't confusing enough, it has to always be neck and neck with its cousin from a ticker perspective, Boeing. At 203, they're always right next to each other in the top 10. I don't know why that is. I think it's just to mock me because the tickers are so similar Similar over there. 203,000 contracts out there. Number four, we've got another name we don't really see in the top 10 too often, if ever. This is good old Carnival Corp, ticker symbol CCL. Uh, this one, $8 stock, $8.16, but doing 203,000 contracts today. Number four, excuse me, number three, a name you probably heard of, good old Tesla, 204,000 contracts. Number two, name we haven't talked about in a little while, Luckin, maybe Lukin. This is uh, the Chinese Starbucks, effectively. Uh, 221,000 contracts. Number one with a bullet yet again. Good old Apple. Where would the brokerage business be without Apple? Apple has just sing- almost single handedly uh, kept the brokers alive over these last few years. That's all anybody seems to want to trade. That and some spy, a smatter, and a few other names. And you pretty much got the ADV for most of the big brokers out there. Speaking of ADV, let's see what's up. From the overall business perspective, March. Pretty freaking volatile. I think that translates into a little bit of volume as well. Let's see what our friends from OCC have to say about that. And the answer is a whopping yes. March volume was up nearly 63% from March of last year. That makes it the highest volume month ever for the options market, the options industry. Just crushing it. And just think about that for a second. That volume was achieved... And in an, almost for the mo- entirety of that month, a 100% electronic, at least half of it. I forgot exactly the dates that every, every exchange was shut down. But at least half of that month was an entirely electronic marketplace and still doing 62.8% more volume than this time last year. If you're wondering what that translates to, OCC clearing a total of 670.6 million contracts. Uh, that the previous record, guess when that was? Last month. February, <laughs> the month before it, 568 million. So a wee bit more than that in March. Obviously, March a little bit longer month too, so that helps. Uh, the year today, ADV now is 28.4 million contracts. That's that's pretty hard, pretty high, listeners. For anyone out there who doesn't follow the options biz like we do, let's let's drill down a little bit, get into the listed options, see how that played out. Total exchange listed options volume: 662.8 million contracts in March, up 63 and a half percent. Drill down a little bit farther. Equity options volume, 590.7 million contracts, up 61.6%. Cleared ETF volume, that was 303 million, almost exactly. That's up 104.1% from March of last year. And index options, there were 72 million contracts, up 81.2%. Futures also as well. Futures, obviously, pretty much VIX futures. The only futures that really clear these days over there. At OCC listeners, futures was 7.8 million contracts. It's up 20, almost 21%. Not quite as much as you might think, given the environment we're in right now. Maybe the electronic nature hurting uh, CFE a little bit over there. I don't know. But either way, only up 21%. Still pretty robust. But they did six, almost 6.5 million contracts last March, which you think they may have a little bit more on there. But still, fixed futures, maybe the just absurd nature of the term structure out there, spooking some folks, keeping them away from uh, from playing out there. Of course, there are still some earnings like we mentioned this week. If you like to focus on the micro, uh, you got BlackBerry and uh, Conagra on Tuesday. CarMax after the bell today. Chewy, which is kind of the new Pets.com out there as well, as well as WBA, the Walgreens Boots Alliance, straight from Star Trek to a corner store near you. And tomorrow, the owners of Corona Beers, a.k.a. Constellation Brands. They're popping off tomorrow, I believe they are, before the bell there tomorrow. If you want reports on all those guys and a lot more, as well as maybe some prognostications of what's in store for us on what is sure to be a turbulent earnings season to come, you know where to go. Theoptionsinsider.com. we got all those great reports, courtesy of our friends over there at ORATS, the earnings move, earnings move results, all that other good stuff to break down. Speaking of good stuff, well, maybe this is tough. Maybe not so good. I guess we'll find out as we head right on into... The Odd Block. The 
It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. everybody welcome to the odd block the portion of the show where we get weird we get wild mr rock lobster put on your way back pants because we're gonna go back a little bit not too far this time we're gonna check out some activity we talked about pretty much exactly a month ago back on march 5th Uh, we're gonna kick it off with air products and chemicals inc ticker symbol apd this is a name that we talked about uh on again on march 5th looks like someone was coming in at the time with the March 220 puts, looks like someone was drawing a pretty aggressive line in the sand back then. Uh, the stock at the time of this trade was at 231 at the time of this trade. So a wee bit north of that level. And someone deciding, I'm going to draw a little bit of a line in the sand to the downside here. Click myself a little bit of premium. They did it below the bid. They were pretty aggressive on these. Uh, they did it for 3.15 out there, 5,000 times and again, someone just looking to probably draw a little bit of a line in the sand. I guess probably not looking to pick up the stock at that level. I'm going out on the limb and say probably not. And uh, guess what happened in March? <laughs> yeah, the stock took a bit of a nosedive. These guys got run over. On expiration in March, the stock was at, like I mentioned, 189.15. So the puts they sold for $3.15 were worth over $30 when uh, expiration came around. Go figure. These bad boys were still open. Yet another indication that, yeah, this guy probably wasn't maybe buying. Maybe he could have been buying them. He could have got a really sweet deal on buying them below the bid. I don't think so. And then he held on to them to dump his stock. That could certainly be a possibility. But it doesn't seem like that. It seems like this was indeed an opening line in the sand. If that's the case, Mr. Rock Lobster, looks like our friend here got a little bit run over to the tune of about 15, almost 15 and a half million dollars. If you're wondering right now, APD... Up a little bit. It's at about 195, but still way south of that 220 strike. Mr. Rock Lobster, this is the dark side of the line in the sand. You got to have a plan for when it gets crossed. And it looks like our friend here didn't. And as a result, he, he gave up a few million, sir. You know, a few million here, a few million there. It's almost like El Presidente on Barstool Sports day trading Boeing. You know, a half mil here, half mil there. <laughs> uh, if, you want, if you want good entertainment. And also look at him. Oh, my gosh. Um, But anyway, this is definitely one of those. And I I thought when we reviewed this, wasn't this kind of an – this was sort of an aggressive one, right? Because it was March. I'm like, yeah, okay. All right, I I got it. So this wasn't – this was a line in – this line in the sand was a little closer than in our past. Normally, aren't they kind of way out of the money when we – when we look at these things, um, but yeah, I mean, I would assume that he's taking delivery on these and he's got a bit of an ouchie, um, but actually with the stock at one ninety five three, oh yeah, he's, <laughs> he's, he's down 20 bucks. There's no way around it. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a million bucks. That's, 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 that's pretty good money, I guess. So I shouldn't be laughing at the person. That's not good. But, um, uh, this is where a line in the sand. Uh, this is the I'm going to take delivery on the stock line in the sand thing. So, you know, when Tucson maybe writes a put, he expects to take delivery, and this person certainly did. Yeah, it's kind of hard to look at this one pretty much uh, any other way, but uh, this guy, this guy took a bit of a drubbing <laughs> out here. Again, don't want to laugh, but we've all been there. Maybe not to this degree, and hopefully, you had a plan to close these bad boys out, or be a little bit more aggressive. And we don't know. He could have hedged with stock on the way down or something else like that. This is just kind of a worst-case scenario. But it's not looking good here for our friend. Let's move on out to our other name slash victim from the 5th of March. 5th of March, Mr. Rock Lobster. Bit of a dubious day Uh, because we were talking at the time. This is uh, losing money the other way, flipping the script, it seems like. We got someone, looks like they were swinging for the fences in a pharma name. This was Sunesis. Pharmaceuticals, Inc., ticker symbol SNSS. At the time, listeners, we profiled someone coming up 
and pretty much swinging for the fences. This is the cheapy name already. And they were swinging for the $1 calls. So the stock already an option. They decided to spend a decent chunk of the value of the stock. <laughs> Let's go back and see exactly where it was on March 5th. Yeah, the stock closed on March 5th, 96 cents. So they spent almost 20% of the value of the stock on calls that would expire end of March, March expiration, about 5,000 times, lifting the offer there, 20 cents, deciding to swing for those fences. And unfortunately, listeners, I think we all know how the, how the needle turned there in March. You can probably take a guess where most of these names, I mean, I mean Sudestas could have had some play for something coronavirus related, in which case maybe it would have been a different story, but it does not appear to have been the case because on expiration in March, the stock went out at 39 cents. So not even 2x the value of the calls that he bought. So our friend, unfortunately, if those calls were still open, went out worthless. He dropped a little bit less money. He only dropped about $92,000, so not quite the $15.5 million that our other friend did. But still, Mr. Rock Lobster, and you come in, you swing for the fences like this, you load up on options that are going away in less than a month with that cost roughly 20%. Of the value of your underlying, uh, I don't. Uh, that's a hard one to uh, to look at in many scenarios and say that's a great trade. And in this case, Mr. Rock Lobster, it turned out to be anything but, sir. Um, from what I can tell, this was not good. Um, although you have to imagine buying calls in just about anything in the month of March was probably a tough call. Um, uh, so. Anyway, I would say, um, you know, you buy out of the money calls, you don't give yourself enough time, it all just goes away. So I think that's what we got on this one. And, uh, you know, and that's, uh, it's just, I think it's just money that flew right out the door. I just, if there's not much more, you can't really sugarcoat this one. Yeah, it's not a lot of, uh, not a lot of good to be said. <laughs> okay. The guy was aggressively short, super short. And he bought these just as on, on a small ratio against his underlying, but on less than he was short, just as a, a hedge against the worst case scenario. So actually, he's laughing all the way to the bank. There we go. The 92,000 pales compared to the many millions he made shorting this stock. I don't think that's the case, listeners, but that's an optimistic way to perhaps look at it. Speaking of looking at things, let's see what you guys are up to. Maybe you're optimistic looking at your responses. I don't think so, though, as we keep on rolling into an extended version of the mail block. <laughs> It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for The Mail Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Mail Block. This is indeed the portion of the program where we break down what the heck uh, you guys have on your brains. Uh, Let's kick it off. We asked you guys earlier this week. A kind of a bit of revisiting a question we asked you the week before, but going out a little bit longer term this time and deciding to ask you guys, you know, last time the level everyone was fixated on the S&P was 2,400. Now it's uh, 2,600. And right now we are at, oh, 2,489. So <laughs> it seems like the dead cat bounce you guys are all fearing, at least from that level, perhaps was in. But we asked you guys uh, yet again, Market was rallying at the time you posted this. The S&P had just blown through 2,600. We asked one month from now, so one month from earlier this week, where do you think we'll be? Think this is going to, we're going to be higher? This rally has some legs to it. Think we're going to be lower? This is, again, the mother of all dead cat bounces here. You think we'll be right around that 2,600 level? Or once again, are you in cash and just insulated from all cares? You have no cares in the world. And as of a few minutes ago before showtime, this will be live, I think, till tomorrow. I'll see if you haven't had a chance to get in there. I know a lot of you have, but if you haven't had a chance to get in there, add options, a place to go. Uh, 63.5% of you saying pretty much lower, a dead cap bounce. So right now you're right, kind of hard to argue with you. But you've been fading this rally for a while in all of our polls, and it seems like that trend is continuing. Uh, right around here, actually, second place, 17.9%, saying pretty much right around 2,600. So maybe a month from now, effectively unched, which is interesting. Uh, 13, about 13.5% of you saying this rally is real. We're going to be higher than 2,600. And only about 5, a little over 5, about 5.5% of you saying you're in cash right now and you don't care. Master the game, 369 chiming in saying he's bearish 
for sure a month from now the economic data is just now starting to trickle in unless the Fed gets power to buy spy shares. <laughs> Wouldn't that be interesting? The Fed just uh, just gobbling up all, all, of, all of the spy, just taking it all down. Fed on the bid. That would be an interesting day. He says, unless Fed gets the power to buy spy shares, this will continue to bleed as businesses go under and people are forced to capitulate or cover their margin calls. All right, next up, uh, we got, let's see, oh, this, this name looks familiar. We've guessed is an old, old-time listener. He's, he's been listening for a long time. Good to hear his voice there, see his name there again. I think he's the guy who might have even sending that cool license plate of the Vicks puts floating around back in the day up there. I think it was in Maine or New Hampshire, something like that. He says, hi, gents. This is Brian Colomer. He says, hi, gents. <laughs> uh, in my Roth. I'm long a couple of 300, 305 call spreads in SPY. One, are, one is the June, so expiring on June 20th. He says the ex-div date there. He gets a buck 40 on the dividend uh, expiration. The other is the 18th of September. So he's got 300, 305 call spreads, one in June, one expiring in September. I bought these during those 10% down days. I couldn't resist. Hey, we've all been there, Brian. No shame in that. He goes on to write, anyhow, as I'm short some calls, will I be on the hook for the dividends should these 300 calls go in the money? So if the short calls do go at the money or in the money, I need to look at the bid for the 300 puts and compare to the dividend, uh, right? Do I need to worry about this on the ex-div date or the payout date? Thank you for your fantastic podcast, Brian. Oh, it's P.S., I missed the OO show. Oh, the old Options Odyssey show. Yeah, I missed the old Options Odyssey show on the Options Insider. Yeah, we're with you. We like doing that one, too. That one's kind of a bit of a victim of its own success. It was, it was pretty popular. So I guess I think TD is maybe doing their own network right now. Among some other inspirations they had out there, that was certainly one of them. Uh, so, yeah, that was, on the, that was exclusive to TD. You can only really get it on TD. They wouldn't really let us broadcast. You had to be a TD member and be in their chat room to get that show. Mr. Rock Lobster actually did that show with me. It was kind of fun. Uh, but yeah, we missed that one too. We'll have to bring that one back one of these days. Talk some unusual activity. Speaking of, speaking of Mr. Rock Lobster, since you've been invoked, sir, on this, uh, he, he mentions he misses your old show of Options Oddities. Uh, what do you have to say here for Brian? He's got these 300, 305s. He's worried about getting, he says the 300s, but he should be short the 305s, I believe, if he bought these verticals. So if he's short the 305s, maybe walk our listeners through. I think Brian's pretty safe here in these verticals, but... For anyone out there who short calls in general, what he's talking about here with uh, comparing the bid on the puts or to comparing the puts in general to the value of the dividend and what to watch out for if your short calls usually naked in this environment, sir. Yeah, because he's, he's worried about 300s and spy um, right now. I think he's going to. Well, today he's going to be OK. We don't know uh, how uh, how it'll be later. But, yeah, generally the rule is. Very rarely, if you're assigned early, it's a mistake um, because every time a liquidity provider assigns or exercises a call, he's synthetically selling a put. So unless they have a clerk or some newbie that screws up, they're only going to exercise. They're going to wait to exercise, though, till the very last minute, which generally will be the day before XD when they do the exercise. Uh, spy exercise. Spy is a quarterly, the day before this. Uh, what I would call the the future expiration. So that's uh, you know March, June, seventies. Um, if the value of the dividend is worth more uh, than the put on that strike a day before XD, it's likely to be assigned. Um, so I would just let you know that's kind of the rule. Um, and the SPY has massive assignments every every uh, every quarter. So it's definitely a real thing. But in general, unless it's a massive boo-boo, um, and I've been helping retail traders now for eight or nine years, I've only seen one early exercise that was off. That was a total mistake. And somebody assigned somebody some short TLT calls way back when for a dividend. So uh, – after I calmed the assignee down, I'm like, you just made a lot of money, dude, because there was, there was $1.20 in premium in those options. So once they finally figured out what the deal was, like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> I just got a free $1.20. So um, anyway, um, that's, that's the deal on that. 
uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know how much more to add to that than that's that's the case for a, a call assignment. Yes, I mean, like I, I, I always refer to that as stupid exercise. Uh, you see it, or I see it, maybe about once every four or five years. It's something like what Andrew described, uh, and that uh, someone exercises their options if they're trying to get a dividend, but there was still more juice in the um, call itself. Or occasionally, I've even seen people exercise out of the money options. Uh, so it, it does happen, uh, and you need to be aware of it. Uh, just. Make sure that you keep an eye on it. Dividends are very real. Uh, that's something that I keep on my personal calendar uh, when SPY dividends are coming up. Because if you have in the money calls, uh, you might be short some shares and paying a dividend you really didn't want to pay uh, if you're in the money at times. So just be careful with it. Something to watch. Yeah, it's something to watch out for. I mean, you're, I think 300 level, 3,000 in the S, you're, you're probably pretty safe. But again, you're going out a little bit, so we don't know. And then also you got that vertical, so that helps you not just naked short these things. I'd be much more concerned uh, on that front there. You got the call there, <laughs> so you're you're okay. And if someone comes in early, yeah, you're that's like Andrew like Andrew laid out. That could actually work out pretty well uh, for you here. And I think in general, we're worried about which date. I think you should as soon as the dividend starts approaching in uh, in spy spy in particular. People always forget about the dividend in spy. So I'm glad to see you're on it early. That shows you've been listening. To our shows. Once the dividend starts lurking on the horizon is when you want to start paying attention. That's when those early exercises, they can start coming in at any time. It doesn't have to be, as Andrew said, it doesn't have to be on that date. If folks are spooked or got something else going on, that's what they could pop off. And of course, if you're worried about all this, you can always just take it off right before, <laughs> right before the event. I don't think you have to worry about it. I think you're good, especially because you have that vertical. You're not just naked short the 305s and, hey, what's going to happen? Uh, so you got that other call there to backstop you a little bit. Uh, but in general, good thing to be cognizant of in spy land. Always remember the div lurking out there. People forget it every quarter. And it's, I see the emails coming in. I'm like, okay, it's spy dividend time again. I don't have to check the calendar. I just know when the emails start coming in that it's that time of year. Um, let's see. Uh, let's, let's, go, let's go to Uncle Mike's question here. They got a question just for you, Mr. Uncle Mike. Comes from Nikolai. He says, does Uncle Mike, all one word, Uncle Mike, I like that. That's your name now, Uncle Mike. Uncle Mike still like XLE to play energy oil. Does he prefer USO? Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, what is your preferred methodology for playing some energy slash crude, sir? I would definitely like XLE better just because of the fact that USO, um, it's not really a true uh, following of uh, oil itself. Uh, and then I think XLE gives you diversification. I think XLE will also give you some benefit if the markets increase. And um, I'm still a fan of XLE if you want to do that in a non-futures-based account. Now, if you have a futures account uh, and you have the money and it makes sense from a standpoint of risk-reward and you want to play directly, then by all means, buy some net gas or some oil futures. But uh, that could be a little bit co- more costly uh, depending on just how much money you're using with it. So definitely XLE over USO for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. USO is obviously attempting to replicate that front month WTI future listeners and does a pretty dubious job of doing that, especially now, of course, we're in a pretty heavy contango out there in the future. That's going to really impact because it rebalances, I believe, when it's two weeks to go. So effectively, that negative roll yield is really I've seen some estimates it can get up to as high as like 15 percent a month or so out there in a product like X, like, excuse me, like USO. So it's the same thing you see with VXX. It happens with USO, which makes the long-term buy-and-hold scenario that a lot of you are looking at a cheap USO right now as kind of a challenging prospect. you got a lot of headwinds against it. Of course, that contango could eventually go away, and that will make things a little bit easier. But until you see some strong firming up of demand out there in the crude side, it's going to be hard, I think, to make a long-term. Anything you're going to do in either of these, I think, should be pretty short-term, be pretty nimble with. You don't want to just buy USO right now because it's so cheap. I know it's tempting. It was 4 bucks. Uh, Think, what can I lose? Four bucks, right? But it's, it's a good possi- – it's five bucks now, so you missed out on a buck. But <laughs> in general, the thing could languish there for quite some time until we see Saudis and Russia still saner heads prevail out there. There's not a lot of upside argument for crude in the near term here. Um, here's an interesting one. Damien. Wasn't that the evil baby from like Rosemary's Baby or something like that? Writing in Damien saying, hey there, love the show. Well, right back at you, Damien. We love you and all the other folks who listen and write in and, and keep us sane in these crazy times. Without you guys listening and sending in your questions, we'd go nuts here. So thanks for that. 
Uh, he writes, goes on to write, I have a question about the long guts spread. Guts spread. Interesting name. Uh, is it possible to modify it by adding a diagonal component? Specifically, buying one in the money call with a long expiration and buying one in the money put hmm, at short term expiration. My expectation for the underlying is long term bullish and short term periodic weakness. I am new to options. I've thought about this strategy as a way to hedge a leaps position and possibly profit during short term downswings. Would this even work? Is it too expensive or is there a much better way, but in parentheses, probably? To execute this strategy. Thanks so much. Oh, a couple of things to unpack here. First off, gut spread. It's not a term I've ever really thrown around. Usually the use case we most commonly see for guts are on spreads with wings. So like your flies and your condor and things like that. The inside meteor legs of those are typically referred to as the guts. Uh, so you can have things like a gut strangle and stuff like that. It kind of makes some sense. Uh, this time version of a long gut spread is not really – not a use case I use. In fact, what you're referring to, a long in-the-money leap, is typically more often referred to as going to be just a straight-up stock substitution play. In fact, go check out our shows like OPR where Brian there does a lot of variations on this, including the fig leaf where he buys a long in-the-money leap and then he usually sells a near-term out-of-the-money call against it. That's the usual scenario to effectively hedge this. this. This use case of buying a put against your long-term leap, that's an interesting one, not one we've really discussed too much on the network before. Uh, before I get into this in, in too much depth, Mr. Rock Lobster, maybe we'll start with you. I'm curious what your thoughts are on, on hedging a leap with a nearer-term put. He, as he mentions, this is an expensive way to go. What are your thoughts on that use case, sir? Uh, so I, I don't think that's a bad idea. That's something that, uh, we do an option pit. Some of my, uh, mentees do those diagonal, uh, you know, it's like, it's kind of a funky diagonal spread. Uh, the easiest way too is that long-term leap has a Delta, right? So usually there are no more than 50 deltas. Um, and it's easy to create like something close to 50 deltas with a near the money or let's say a one month out put spread, right? That'd be about 25 deltas. So I think of it as the short term trade is just something to try to make you money if the market decides to go down, uh, straight down. Um, and it's not, you know, sometimes it might be able to pay for the entire leap depending on the type of put or spread you buy. But, yeah, that's certainly a viable strategy right now because the ball's so expensive, though. Um, you're paying an awful lot for that leap, like crazy amount relative to, I'll say, six or seven weeks ago where the same option uh, might be to cost twice as much, at least, as it did before uh, relative to the money, you know, to, you know, to the moneyness. So I would be careful about there when the ball comes crashing down. Uh, see what happens to the option that you've chosen. Have a good um, long-term dollar goal where you think your stock might be. That way you're making sure you're picking the right leap. Um, but, yeah, I think like the short-term, your short-term run with long-term right, I do that a lot. Um, that is a strategy that I use. It, it can work. It actually helped me out in the whole oil complex because I was long some longer. I was actually short put spreads in the longer term. Uh, some of the oil stocks and XOP and stuff like that, they all got annihilated. But I was long put short term against them that I kept rolling down. I actually made a little money on the whole thing. It was a lot of work for very little money, uh, but at least it kept me from getting annihilated. So, um, yes, to that as a strategy. Um, now I'm sitting on all those those long positions at the bottom. I don't have any puts anymore. <laughs> There's no, It's hard for it to go any lower. There's no puts to buy. So... Um, so yeah, I would say, yes, that is a strategy that can work. Um, and I use it. So what the heck? Um, not much, not much else to add to that. The rock lobster using, it's not, it's not a use case we typically discuss because it's not that popular people, as you might imagine, shelling out extra money is not a use case people usually write to us for. They usually write for ways to pay for that leap, hence things like the fig leaf and stuff. But, you know, as rock lobster mentioned, it is effectively like an underlying position is a stock substitution, by the way, I will off the caveat there, the long-term leaps in the money, so it's going to be a little bit more than 50 delta, not less than 50 delta like the Rock Lobster. That's what you're looking for anyway when you're doing stock substitution. You want a little bit more meat on the bones, 
not less. But yeah, there's a lot of Vega out there, which is <laughs> a wee bit pricey right now. So if you didn't do this right now, maybe pick your poison a little bit. Look at your names. Look at the vol, what these things are trading at. Compare it. Hopefully your broker has a decent platform. You could compare it to some of the historical volatility levels, even from a month ago. And you can see how much maybe more you're paying out there on that name. And, of course, these are going to be wide as well because they're leaps. They're not as liquid. And you don't mention what name you're talking about. So it could be an illiquid name to begin with. So the spread also could be a bit of a discouraging factor to doing this. But, again, it is analogous to stock. That's why you're doing this position. So hedging it in the near term, not the craziest thing. But, yeah, you kind of mentioned it's going to be expensive. So probably a spread to mitigate your costs. And, again, keep it quick. Keep it short. We said it before on the network. Keep it small. Keep it simple. Keep it safe. All right. Let's see. Yeah, we got to keep on rolling, unfortunately. Uh, I think we'll have to answer more questions later today on Twifor. You guys got a bunch of them. So keep on rolling right on into Around the Block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to Around the Block, the portion of the show. We break down what the heck we're watching for the rest of this week. I'll start with you, Uncle Mike, because you did clarify the one Damien I forgot. How could I forget Damien? Jake the Snake Roberts' snake. Of course, that was Damien. Maybe that's who was writing into us. He's a snake who's pretty savvy, and he's hedging his uh, long-term leaps option position. <laughs> All right, Mr. Uncle Mike, uh, wrestling aside, maybe, maybe you got more wrestling nuggets for us. What else are you watching? I think WrestleMania is this weekend, I think, so maybe you're watching that, sir. What else you, what else you got on our radar for the rest of the week into the weekend, sir? Well, just hoping that this coronavirus doesn't put the DDT to this market. That's all I'll say before I go any further with that one. Um, in terms of watching the, uh, of what's going on in the marketplace, uh, watching silver, silver is catching a little bit of a bid. Um, not planning on doing anything just based on what the calls and puts are doing, but, uh, silver is catching a bid. Just going to keep an eye on that. Um, 2,500 is a round number with the S and P. So keeping an eye on that kind of, but I think just with uh, non-farm tomorrow and with the numbers that are coming out tomorrow, we're going to see uh, just how what the market's reaction to it is. I mean, I know it's a little bit of a there's um, it's not completely totally up to date, so to speak, because uh, well, let's be honest, news changes every ten minutes in this environment. But just want to see how the market reacts to it because uh, it is a big news announcement. And curious if the market says, okay, well, we don't care. We already knew that things were bad or whatever. So who cares? Or the market's going to say, oh, things are really worse than we thought, or maybe things are better than we thought. Who knows? So watching that and uh, continuing to watch uh, the uh, oil soap opera that we have going on in the Middle East and seeing what XLE does with it and uh, all the other stuff that I didn't mention. So watching everything. All right, everybody. And Mr. Rockloff, your same question for you, sir. What are you watching for the rest of this week into the weekend? Uh, just, you know, I'm looking for light at the end of the CO COVID-19 tunnel. It's still, um, I think there's still just a lot of indeterminates. Uh, with the, no surprise, nobody really knows what's going on. We, we got some pretty huge uh, potential numbers uh, at the beginning of the week. Uh, I think New York is kind of ground zero. And just to see how New York goes, if things start to improve a little bit. You know, right now they're setting up tents and they've got stuff in the Jacobs Javits Center and all kinds of, you know, it's just serious. A lot of people are, uh, a lot of people are coming down with it and um, um, filling up hospitals. And I think we see how New York goes and that will kind of be, you know, somehow the the plan on how uh, cities and towns and stuff start to deal with this going forward. So I just think we still have a, you know, a couple of weeks of, a little back and forth, not so great um, before uh, things start opening up again. Like I said on Twitter, you, when you can get your hair cut, that's when Vix will be below 25. <laughs> when you go to the barber and get your hair cut. We are not close to that yet. I, I like that. The haircut. Uh, the barber. The barber index. When you can go get a haircut, maybe things will be right with the world again. Unfortunately, listeners, that music means coming to the end, at least of this program, don't worry. If you're listening live, we got some fun stuff coming for you. Twifo, if you're listening after the fact, just hit next. By the way, some of you looks like having issues with Mixler again. It seems like a lot of that is localized to the desktop version, so try the mobile version if you're not. A lot of people are still in there, so 
clearly it's working for a lot of you, but I know some people who are seem to be having issues seem to be on the desktop version. So try the mobile if you're if it's not working on the desktop. Hopefully that'll be a little bit better for you. Again, internet across the globe having issues these days, so mixed not surprising. They're coming under some strain as well. But before we go, let me go back around the horn. Let's start with the uncle list of Mike's. Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, I can't imagine a time where I'd want someone to perhaps hold my hand in these markets more than now. If I want said services, sir, where should I go? What should I do? Go to stcharleswealth.com and on the website, uh, there's a spot for signing up for an appointment. Talk to me. I'm giving. I'm talking with people every day on uh, just new people that are coming in that I haven't been with before. Uh, how do I get back to even? What is the opportunity? What do I do at this stage? Contact me. I got a million ideas uh, on such a thing for your own portfolios. Uh, or if you're not on the internet, 630-885-0017. Call me directly. More than happy to work with everyone. In terms of the Barber Index, uh, maybe we should ask Bruce the Barber Beefcake on that as well. <laughs> that is all. You're just full of 80s wrestling references. If you want more of those listeners, you want someone just kind of just talk you off the ledge or maybe roll some puts for you in these troubled times, Uncle Mike Tussaw, stcharleswealth.com is the place to go. Mr. Rock Lobster, if I want someone to explain to me how these crazy ball things are working out there, maybe how your barber index works in more detail. Perhaps I want to join a fun ball trading club. Where should I go? What should I do? Yeah, go to optionpit.com, go to the Ball Trading Club. Also, look for a new product from Option Pit. Uh, it will be a, be a come up with some pretty good trade ideas, uh, trade idea products, but it will also be partly like mentoring. How do you learn to put a trade together based on volatility? So it'll be kind of a soup to nuts on, you know, you have some sort of fundamental case and you want to learn how to use ball to help create the right positions that will actually make you money if things go up or down and uh and have a decent risk reward profile so you don't get taken to the poor you know to the poor house it's a good way to learn how to structure stuff so anyway you look for that coming out from option pit very 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 soon there you go optionpit.com is the place to go and on behalf of the of i almost said the greases and meatballs on behalf of the rock lobster and uncle mike and indeed myself I think all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for sending in those questions. Keep them coming. I'm going to answer a few more of those on the old Twifo, which is coming up in about half an hour. In the meantime, we'll put in some fun stuff. Those of you listening live, we can get the mixer to work of uh, all things pandemic volatility, how advisors and asset managers are looking at it and dealing it with now. We'll be back in exactly half an hour. Talk all things going on in the world of futures options. Spoiler alert, there's a lot. So we'll get to that, answer a bunch of your questions there as well. Listen, and after the fact, of course, just hit next on your podcast device of choice. And we'll see you back here tomorrow, 1 p.m. Central, for Volatility Views, and then right back again on Monday for more of the Option Block. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.